and I'm also the chair of the local networks energy and environment group. I would like to welcome you to this evening's webinar along with my co-host Carl Folkstone. The Merseyside and Western Cheshire Local Network is based in the northwest of England and includes the Isle of Man. The local network has a number of specialist groups, of one of which is the Energy and Environment Group. Can we have the next slide, please, Martin? The Energy and Environment Group members are focused on the issues of providing energy whilst protecting and improving the environment by organising free to attend events and technical visits. Because of the impact of COVID-19 pandemic, we are presently using Zoom webinars for our events. The group is focused is deliberately wide ranging to embrace all aspects of the provision, distribution and use of energy and the associated environmental issues from the technical and engineering perspective. The focus of the Energy and Environment Group is in the following areas. The generation of electricity using low carbon technologies or with carbon capture. The transformation of distribution and storage of electricity. The issues of environmental impact and mitigation of, of the generation, transmission and distribution and utilization of electricity. The use of hydrogen in the energy supply system. Greenhouse gas emission reduction, including carbon capture. And the use of energy in transport systems. If you have any proposals for future events that fit into the group's focus, I'd be pleased to hear from you. There'll be details of that later on. Next slide, please, Martin. Uh, the group is working on development of future events, including webinars, face-to-face -face lectures when COVID, and technical visits when COVID-19 restrictions allow. If you have an idea for an event, please contact me. My, my contact details are given later and on the chat. We hope you run four more webinars in 2021, two before the summer break at the end of July, and two between the 1st of September and the end of November 21. Next slide, please, Martin. Slide four, Martin. This evening's webinar is on the topic of the Mersey Tidal Power Project. The presentation will be given by Martin Land. Martin is the project director of the Mersey Tidal Power Project, working for the Liverpool City Region Combined Authority, and is a member of the Institute of Mechanical Engineers, having started his career as an instrument artist for, or TIFI with ICI. Martin has an extensive project delivery and business development experience across a clean energy and rail infrastructure, with a focus on environmental and safety critical sectors. Martin has experience in many areas of energy transformation, including power generation, gas, coal, nuclear. Martin is focused on clean energy, carbon capture, and the use of hydrogen in the energy system. As this presentation is within the PERDA period related to the local elections, then the presentation will be focused on project activities and its place in the future of the regional, regional energy mix. So Martin, can I hand over to you now, please? Thanks, Rob. Um, so thanks for the opportunity um, to present to um, you know, the IET uh, and interested parties tonight. Um, I think as, as Rob said, uh, I want to, to give you an overview in the context of the Mersey title project, um, set it in the, the strategic sort of context of the Liverpool city region and the Northwest and also then touch on just some of the wider issues around interfaces and I suppose whole energy system uh, for the future uh, as we go on you know the journey towards uh, decarbonisation. So I think this was Rob's slide but it, it, it's there you know um, I'm, I'm going to try and run through the presentation in around 40 minutes and, and you know I'll be staying around for Q&A uh, hopefully, I apologise for that. <laughs> so, so hopefully, um, you know, I can answer all the Q and A. If there's too many questions, we'll we'll, we'll collect them and come back to you. Uh, no problem with that. Uh, so please, you know, do submit questions. Um, if, if I see them during the presentation and I can deal with them, I will. If not, we'll we'll bring them after. Um, the webinar is being recorded, so I think everyone's aware of that. So there's a chance to watch it back. Uh, and, you know, as with all good events, uh, after hours, CPD certificates will be provided. Um, and, you know, are, are, are most welcome. 
So I think just in, in terms of a, a project overview, um, yeah, I'm going to talk to you about the Mersey Tidal project. It's a tidal range project. So we're looking to work off the potential energy of the change in height of tide, both on the flood as uh, the tide comes in and on the ebb as the tide goes out. And generally that happens um, twice a day you know, around about 12.4 hours in terms of a cycle, and hence high tides and low tides move across um, across the calendar. Um, th there's a concept of spring tides, which are generally our highest tides, and the concept of neat tides, which are generally our lowest tide range change. And again, that's probably on about a 14, 15 day cycle. So you don't just get spring tides, the highest tide uh, during the spring. Uh, it, it's it's a continuous, you know, 20, 22 times a year, uh, you get those peak tides um, uh, every sort of 12 and a half hours. So again, L Liverpool, uh, in, in terms of the Mersey and, and the Liverpool Bay is well placed to use that natural resource. It's a project that's been considered uh, over a number of years. Uh, and indeed, the sort of first project was considered uh, up to 100 years ago. And we're now looking at that again. So we're at feasibility stage. Uh, we don't have a final uh, site for the project. So we're still looking at the option of a, a barrage, uh, which would be you know, from the left bank of the Mersey on the Wirral side to the right bank on the Liverpool side, or as a uh, lagoon uh, out into to Liverpool Bay. And again, I think you know, the, the, the options for lagoons um, which are slightly more expensive because you're having to encompass all the water. You're not just using uh, the river bank uh, as part of your containment. Um, they are expensive, um, more expensive than a straight barrage, but they're also got a higher energy yield. And as we move towards uh, decarbonizing our energy system and, and looking for more electricity, uh, potentially the market is there for, for a lagoon. Um, in the northwest and, and in other places down the west west coast of the UK. So just in terms of context of uh, Liverpool city region. So Liverpool city region is the uh, combined authority over six of the local authorities in the northwest, uh, being the city of Liverpool, St. Helens, uh, Knowlesley, Sefton, the Wirral and Halton. Uh, but also, you know, we, we border on with uh, Warrington, with uh, Cheshire West uh, and with North Wales. And really uh, the context of, of the tidal project as a low carbon, um, you know, gigawatt scale generation asset is as part of the Northwest regional asset as we move um, towards, uh, you know, getting rid of fossil fuels in our, in our energy generation, um, you know, closing out the coal stations, We'll, we'll see closure of our older nuclear stations, the, the advanced ga gas reactor fleets, um, and obviously we'll be bringing wind, solar, uh, and other technologies to market. But we still think there's space uh, for tidal uh, to come in and, and be part of the, the green energy mix uh, as demand grows. We've also got the advantage that it's close coupled uh, to, to the city region. The city region is about one and a half million people uh, and having an asset close to, to those people can help us uh, both in, in terms of peak demand, but also in terms of overnight demand when we think about charging electric vehicles in the future. So I think just in terms of the Liverpool city region context, it's, it's part of our clean growth agenda um, the project was part of the devolution deal agreed with government in terms of the combined authority to work collaboratively to develop the project. It fits well with the Build Back Better green recovery agenda, our ambitions around an inclusive economy. Um, we've got a great sort of marine and maritime history uh, in, in the region. And, and again, you know, we want to lever off those strengths and it fits as a transformational project within our industrial strategy. So ju just before I go into the project, I, I, I suppose just try and anchor ourselves in terms of what we see as future electricity demand. And it's quite interesting that, you know, we're seeing at the moment a slight downturn in demand as we go through COVID. Um, 
similar to the sort of downturn we saw around about 2007 when we had the, the financial crash. And it takes a little bit of time to recover. So you've got a mix of new technology of efficiency coming through that stops uh, that demand growing straight away. But then as you start switching fuels, uh, by 2030, you've got about a 15% growth in uh, demand. And then out by 2050, it's also it's almost a doubling of demand. And yeah, that's the assumption that we carry on with a net zero strategy. Uh, that we start to move towards electric vehicles, the use of heat pumps, uh, and to remove fossil fuels uh, and, and some other, um, you know, older technologies for, from our systems. So this comes out of the uh, six carbon budget, and you know, this was a slide we've been using internally as we we talk to um, some of my colleagues within within the combined authority. Um, yeah, so. I've got an energy background, an engineering background. Lots of them have got policy uh, and other backgrounds. So, you know, I, I act as um, a, a reference point on some of the energy areas. But in, in, instead of just giving them my view, it's easy to bring in the view of uh, people like, you know, the Committee on Climate Change. I think what's always interesting in this diagram and some of the other diagrams is this idea that the demand is somewhere in the future. Um, but I think, you know, we generally understand that renewables have already uh, made a big impact over the last 10 years and our emissions are, you know, significantly less on the electricity side of the system. Um, you know, and I'll touch on that at the moment. I think what's also interesting is this sort of area of 300 terawatt hours uh, of national demand. Um, you know, it's really still only about 20, 25 percent of the total energy usage. You know, so whilst we're, we're, we're decarbonizing electricity quite fast, it's actually when we start growing our electricity demand that we've got to carry on bringing low carbon sources through as we displace natural gas and, and um, you know, coal and, and both in transportation and in uh, industrial use. I think the other uh, chart that's, you know, again, fascinating when you look at the progress is the idea that currently we're, we're down around um, 245 units of um, carbon dioxide per kilowatt hour. You know, five years ago, it, it was about 350. And in 2050, the target is one to two. But again, by 2035, you're getting down at, at this 10 to 20 unit range. But again, electricity is only part of the emissions. So we, we can follow this flight path uh, by eradicating coal generation, uh, by starting to look at abatement, um, carbon capture on, on gas. But interestingly, if you think back to the previous slide, it's around 2035 that we start to see this significant growth in electricity. So the massive assumption is every new asset you build from 2030 is really uh, at a net zero level is, is green. And again, this is consistent data from the six carbon budget. And in the last couple of days, we, they've looked to take this into law uh, and, and push the targets for 2035. So 2035 is really that point when we'll have um, closed a lot of our AGR fleet on, on nuclear, closed all our coal stations, um, some of the first and second generation gas turbine uh, combined cycle plants will be closed and will be really reliant on a mix of low carbon generation. I think the, the overall number that we see um, for 2050 capacity is, is around about the 145 to 178 gigawatts. So this was out of National Grid's future energy scenarios. So this is in gigawatts rather than terawatt hours. And within that, there was an identified uh, contribution of renewables or, or tidal generation of around about 10 gigawatts, which fits well with around about uh, 30 gigawatts of potential around the UK coast uh, that is convertible. So the Mersey Tidal project at the moment, we, we've got a couple of uh, scheme options uh, around about a gigawatt scale, but up as high as five. Five is probably uh, too much, you know, we'd probably need to restrict it around three and a half, four, so that we can fit in 
with um, transmission requirements and, 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 and connections, and I'll touch on that a little bit later. Certainly within the Northwest and going back to work that Bayes did, you know, nearly a decade ago, it was recognized that the Northwest tidal resource was in the eight to 12 range, and there are other projects up the coast. So, you know, Colwyn Bay at Moston, um, you know, there's been uh, schemes up around Fleetwood uh, and Morecambe Bay. Um, so the, the, the significant potential, and because the tide range at different points of the geography is, is slightly different, then there is the chance um, to actually smooth generation by having a number of schemes uh, up the coast. But I think overall UK tidal resource was estimated in the 25 to 30 gigawatt range. Um, and, and like I say, 10 gigawatts seems to be a, a feasible level that could be developed as a portfolio in the next 20 years. I think it's only if we have an industry uh, will we get the economies and the benefits and the fleet um, advantage of, of um, you know, pushing forward. So we don't see ourselves as a one-off scheme. We see ourselves as part of a number of schemes that could be developed by different people. So ju just sort of checking in on the project parameters. Uh, so again, it's tidal range. So it's the, the height difference. It's not tidal stream, which would be more like a, you know, a, a submerged turbine in the ravine uh, where tidal current is passing over it almost all day. Um, we, we, we're looking at the difference in height and taking that potential energy out of it. So at least one gigawatts and up to four. Why here? Well, the Mersey area has the, the highest combination of a tidal range, a, a, an 8.4 meter difference next to a large population, uh, which in the city region is around about 1.5 million. So if you go down to the seven, you've got a higher tidal range. If you go to London, you've got more people, but London's got a lower tidal range and the seven estuary, unless you really uh, stretch Bristol, Cardiff, Swansea and all those areas into it have got a lower population. So we've got this nice idea of close coupling um, supply and, and demand. In terms of contribution, um, around about two to seven terawatt hours of annual generation. And at two terawatt hours, that would currently be around about 30% of the local regional electricity demand. Obviously, if electricity demand grows, then that could drop to be 15% if demand doubles. So it's around about a decade to develop and deploy, uh, but it's for an asset that will operate for around about 120 years. So the idea of a decade providing assets for a century um, and in that time, you know, a wind turbine project might be built out three or four times, nuclear might be built out twice. So again, the comparison of one tidal project against one nuclear or one tidal against one wind project is probably not, not a really fair comparison. Uh, in terms of technical innovation, we, we think it's generally low risk. So we're looking at multiple uh, generating units around about 25 megawatts, so around twice the size of current offshore wind. Um, generally using a low speed turbine, and uh, I'll show you an image of, of a typical turbine later, um, and, and generally based on hydro technology uh, that's relatively mature. So again, long term asset, it takes a little bit of time to build it like a, any hydro project, but you're, you're locking the benefit in for a long term with, with quite a low uh, operation and maintenance regime. And once you've done the payback over, um, I'm not going to give you an exact number, but you know, let, let's say over 10, 15, 20 years, you've then got low cost electricity for up to 80, 90 years. And that's certainly the experience in France where the Laurence uh, project was built out, you know, pr probably about 60 years ago now. So just in terms of the historic timeline, um, like I say, there was some first ideas of a barrage across the Mersey uh, around about 100 years ago. Um, Laurence was, was built out uh, in the 60s, and Laurence is, is probably the best tidal range uh, in on on the sort of Western European front. Um, and th there's been interest in doing something in the Mersey back to the AEA, uh, the Mersey Barrage Company that was set up, and then more recently Northwest Development Agency in Peel. Um, 
and all those schemes have sort of floundered a little bit um but yeah perhaps in the way that other renewable schemes floundered but we we've generally now got a environment that values decarbonization values um long-term assets um and we we just need to nudge that a bit more forward to get a viable project for investment so we're in um phase three of development phase one and two were generally uh consultancy led as advisory um work to the combined authority whereas now in phase three we've started to build a small team and control uh, a number of work packages ourselves so starting to build some um, intelligent client capability so that when we get to start consenting the project we're actually representing what we think the project brings rather than just um, you know sharing consultant slides so um, quite a busy phase we'll be running out to March next year uh, under our current budget and then going into phase four which will start to look at consenting and feed engineering with you know an idea of a construction start somewhere mid-century uh, sorry mid-decade and be operational in the early 2030s so just in terms of strategic context we we've touched on a little bit of this um there's obviously an increase in awareness and drive for change in terms of mitigation and adaption um to, to the challenge of sea level rise uh, temperature rise and uh, trying to control the overall global temperatures within that magic uh, two degrees one and a half degrees um, or unfortunately three degrees if we don't move fast enough I think net zero as, as a UK concept you know is in strain in law and now um, you know with the six carbon budget being sort of laid in law in, in, in the last week we've got the idea that we need to move away from fossil we need to move to electric vehicles uh, and potentially decarbonize heating and that's generally accepted to increase the amount of electricity that's needed um, you know up to about double of what we use today I think yeah we're, we're increasingly encouraged that people want to spend money on green projects so that we, we're seeing uh, finance become available uh, and not just uh, through traditional routes but through um companies that uh, just want to be associated uh with, with pushing the climate agenda forward quicker um and so th there's a number of technology companies and, and data companies that are, are interested in looking at long-term returns some of them have their own use some of them um you know are wanting to to enter into the market obviously as part of the green employment agenda um the the area wants to benefit from um creating the employment opportunity the training uh, and the skills and, and you know hopefully bringing through apprentices i think nationally we've talked about 400,000 sort of roles being created by 2040 2050 if you take that into region then uh, you know we're talking around 25 to 30,000 uh, jobs around uh, green employment including retrofit electric vehicles hydrogen offshore wind and tidal you know and tidal at its peak could could sort of employ four to five thousand people um on the construction phase um which has got a high element of, of civil construction but has also uh, got a high element of you know uh mechanical electrical you know assembly um so we'll look at, for some modularization there'll be some in situ build uh, and looking to bring sort of digital skills through to that i think strategically we we see that you know offshore winds not enough uh, we have days when we don't have any wind and therefore we've got a, an intermittency we need to deal with i think solar is growing well but you know unfortunately solar doesn't tend to work overnight and between november and march so again we we've got up to 20 gigawatts of uh solar planned in the system uh, but it's not always there we think tidal with the you know predictable tidal pattern you know around about 18 years of predictable uh sort of generation characteristic um can both be predictable flexible and local it can help with stability and potentially you know it's semi-dispatchable so we know when it's going to be dispatchable um you know it's not base load but it, it's not 
it's not intermittent either. You know, we know when it's coming. And as we said earlier, we're making decisions now that will lock in low carbon assets for 100 years. Um, and, and that's part of a real sort of sustainability agenda, um, you know, within the region. And I think also we're seeing that, you know, the technical innovations are starting to give us uh, the opportunity to control the machines are uh, more, you know, both with power electronics uh, and with uh, changing the pitch of blades uh, that allows us to get more energy yield. But that, you know, it, it, it's not the same complexity as an aero engine, and it's certainly not the the same sort of complexity as bringing together, you know, large systems that, that and safety systems for nuclear or carbon capture that you know have got a full chain of event from fuel production through to storage. Um, so we think, you know, again, it, it's relatively a low risk uh, technology, but it has got a high uh, civil element that that needs to be managed. So just in terms of the area that we've been looking at, so part of what we've done in phase three is look at 1600 square kilometers of uh, the sort of marine environment. And, and what we've been doing is basically, uh, we've taken one square kilometer squares and yeah, you know, I was amazed that it added up to 1600, but, but that's what it did when, when, when we commissioned this work. And we've looked at the various constraints um, in terms of spatial planning, in, in terms of habitats, uh, in all these areas, and we, we've come out with with you know some uh, you know a better understanding of what our local environment is, and, and that's quite important because whilst we're looking at a barrage reference that is similar to to what other people have looked at previously, and we're looking at a lagoon reference that is off the coast. These aren't final locations. These are just locations that allow us to to think about some of the engineering challenges whilst we're doing the background environmental work. So in the next three to six months, we'll start to look at how schemes uh, compare against each other. You know how they look in terms of viability and. and uh, in, in terms of investment, but also in terms of the engineering challenges in each of the areas. Um, but, you know, the, I think the message from this is, you know, it is a sensitive environment, but it is a marine environment that, that has been built in recently. You know, we've got the bridge at one end of the Mersey, you know, the Mersey crossing bridge that's been built with caissons in the river. We've got the wind farms built at the other end. Um, we've got the port expansion that's been going on and therefore, you know, it's an area that um, is going to under, undergo change. We, we are certainly a, a national, uh, a nationally significant infrastructure project. So we'll go through the development consent order process with, with environment impact assessments. Um, and, you know, we, 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 we're going through a a sort of stakeholder uh, communication session at the moment and early engagement. Uh, and like I say, we've not started consenting. We've not got the scheme uh, selection at the moment. So we're, we're very much in a listening mode and I'll, I'll touch on that. I, I think it then comes back to this bigger area of, um, yeah, what the macro environment's doing and can we, can we introduce a project? Can we introduce an asset into the region that, um, gives us the idea that there is an element of net gain. And again, net gain on a local level or a regional level, you know, we need to clarify and agree how we judge that. I think the, the other, you know, concern is that we've got a sea level rise prediction in the region and we're, we're a hundred year project. So within that hundred years, we'd expect to see a sea level rise of, let's say two foot, three foot, uh, depending on which scenario you look at. Um, so that's the, the highest sea level. On top of that, you can get storm surge. And so we've been doing something that we're calling Mersey 2150, and we're looking at uh, different stakeholders and what their predictions are of what that means. So what does sea level rise mean to this area? Um, in some cases, you know, it, it could have a, a drastic effect. In, in other cases, it's more a subtle effect. I think what is interesting is that we've done some work with the University of Liverpool. And when we've looked at uh, the D area, the Mersey area, uh, the Alt, and then the Ribble, you get a different um, impact of the sea level rise. So whilst it's generally the same sea level rise, 
in some of the estuaries, you're getting a net transfer of sediment in. In some of them, you're getting a net uh, transfer of sediment out. But it's not the same across those four rivers that are, you know, within 40, 50 miles of each other. Um, so again, we're trying to understand that quite, quite importantly because our, our ambition on the um, on the scheme is that we're not trying to affect the tidal curve. So the natural level of water, uh, we might hold it back slightly, but we won't try and um, exceed the the tidal conditions um, across the natural curve. So the intertidal areas will try and protect, the shoreline will try and protect. We're not looking to drastically change those. But actually, if we if we don't do anything as a project, there will be some change through sea level rise. And so again, when we're doing our assessments, we're doing them against the current baseline, but there will be changes that have not been um, agreed or written down by various stakeholders. So, you know, this idea of looking at the Mersey 2150 without any infrastructure change it is quite important because we don't we don't want to be perceived as being naive uh, in terms of how we do the environmental assessment. But also, you know, it may mean that a two foot change means our asset should be built two foot higher or have the capability of being extended by two foot. You know, and that might not be in the initial capital cost, but it might be something we need to provide for it within the life of the project. So I think just touching back on um, tidal range, um, the, the, the sort of global map on the left shows the areas uh, in the world that have, have the biggest tidal range, you know, by the, uh, the red and, and the brown. And obviously in this, uh, area, uh, Northwest France, you've got Laurence. Um, around on, on the other side of the world, we've got the uh, Korean uh, projects at, at Lake Chua. Um, and th this Western coast of Europe it, it is great for, for tidal range. You know, the Canadian coast is great. And, and there's some other hotspots, you know, um, ar around Central America, uh, East Africa and uh, northwest Australia and then down into Antarctica. If you look on the right hand side and, and look at the, uh, the, the G, uh, Great Britain and that northwest France, so again Laurence was developed in, in the Brittany area, um, has been there for 60 years. The Seven has got this great range, um, you know, slightly bigger than um, the Mersey, but it is also, you know, a very wide estuary. So. It, studies there have always uh, looked expensive but you know something can be done and then across into the northwest um, th there's a great range there that there is you know the potential of some schemes on the east but I, I think it's really interesting that we're seeing a dominance of uh, wind generation offshore wind generation uh, springing up uh, from Scotland uh, down to Kent uh, and potentially you know we're, we're seeing some wind um, in the northwest, and I'll touch on that. We're seeing some floating wind potential off island, but tidal range might be something that allows the northwest and, and the west of England to reset. Um, you know, its play into marine technologies. And I think you know we touched earlier on on the regional generation profile. So at the moment, you know, we're showing the Mersey Tidal Power Project as a gigawatt scale. You know, somewhere in the um, the, the, the sort of near shore environment. There's plenty of wind out there. Yeah, I think there's about 11 wind farms out there and there's another four planned. Um, yeah, and we'll touch on that. Uh, we've seen the closure of Wilfa, uh, the, the Magnox uh, reactors a few years ago. Um, we've got Dinorwig and Festinyog as pump storage schemes. We've got Congress Key as a, a gas station. Um, Fiddler's Ferry as coal is closed. And, you know, if you actually think about our skyline now, I mean, that's still there, but you have to go quite a long way to, to find the old coal sites, you know, down towards Ironbridge, which now have been demolished and Rugeley, which, which I think is well through demolition as well. Um, and, you know, there's very little else in terms of central generation. We've got the Carrington site, you know, a, a couple of gas turbines, and then up to Haitian, where I think Haitian one probably, was due for closure 24, 25, and Haitian 2 probably around about uh, 2030. So, you know, just Haitian removing the nucleus there would remove four units. So, 
you know, just over two gigawatts. So it's really interesting, you know, that we're, we're starting to become a, a net importer. Uh, obviously, the will for um, large nuclear is, is currently stalled. There's the potential for uh, small modular reactors to come in, perhaps at Transfinid or even at Wilfa, uh, uh, even at Haysham. But you know, we're starting to struggle in in, in terms of being self-sufficient in the region. Um, and you know, you you can you can take take the view that you know we can rely on the national system. Obviously, we've got um, the Western Bootstrap, the the HVDC coming down from Hunterston, bringing Scottish wind down towards Connors Quay. We've got the Irish interconnector, which is probably, you know, about half a gigawatt or, or you know, 500 MVA connection, bringing Irish renewables across. And then we've got some more wind, but it, it's making us very, very reliant on wind um, in in the area, and you know, with, with the backup of, of some of the gas stations. And it, it is interesting that we're seeing inertia responses, you know, both at D side. And I, I think in, you know, the north part of the Liverpool city region at Leicester Drive, uh, you know, we're starting to see some compensation come into the system. So, you know, as a regional project, we, we think it's, it, it's good. It complements the fact that, you know, we can have uh, hydrogen with carbon capture. We can have, um, you know, some more solar. We can have some nuclear, but we need, you know, we need a mix of, in the jigsaw for the future. I think, you know, for those that, that want to start looking at the project list, this is generally uh, the list of offshore wind that's off our coast. Um, and again, I think it's reinforcing the fact that it's a regional system, you know, so we're talking about the Northwest um, sort of energy system. Uh, and, you know, I think that is quite important as we go forward because Liverpool city region might do tidal, uh, Cheshire and Warrington, you know, might, do more of the hydrogen. Wales might do more of the nuclear. Um, so you know we're we're going to be relying on each other within the northwest, and you know mobility in terms of employment and uh, the the system. I, I think is a great benefit for us all. So at the moment, there's about three gigawatts of offshore wind, and, and there's four gigawatts now in plan, including uh, Owley Moor, which is the extension of the wind farm, or, or you know the, next to Gwinty Moor. And then there's a couple of uh, big schemes that BP uh, are now developing with EMBW, uh, the German uh, energy, and then a, a fourth scheme in the round four allocation, um, which, which is, I think, with some capital partners. But, you know, the system is, it, it, it's interesting when you look at, you know, the urban centers and, and how transmission and distribution works. And again, we'll, we'll touch on that just as, part of you know how we see ourselves fitting i mean for those that um you know want to look at this a bit more detail the chart on the left starts to show the 400 kv system in blue and the 275 in red and as you can see uh, liverpool is actually as a city region is served by you know a ring main um it takes a feed from capenhurst uh in the south and um, on this northern link in, in Terrain Hill. Um, and so, you know, this, this 275 is going to become um, quite critical to the, uh, the regional development. But it also means that if we, if we do a gigawatt scale, we'll probably end up bringing a direct connection uh, somewhere onto the 400 kV and probably at Capenhurst. I think the other bit we're starting to talk about flows. You know, we've we've got two gigawatts coming in on the left-hand side uh, from Scotland. We've got half a gig coming in from uh, Wales. So w this generally flows down uh, towards the Midlands and Birmingham. And if you think again for that previous, you know, Ironbridge is closed and demolished, Rouge is closed. So there's two gigawatts that has been removed off the system feeding uh, into the West Midlands. So you, you know we're we're at a juncture of um, bringing in lots of renewables, lots of wind, but also passing it out both in terms of to the West Midlands and into Manchester. And I think I think this surprised me a bit when I first sort of looked at it. You know, not not being a transmission engineer, that um, you know we were relatively limited in terms of our 400 kV connections. Um, in the area for an area that you know is high on industry high on intensive users um 
you know, I, I always grew up with the view that ICI took 1% of, you know, the country's electricity for electrolysis of brine to produce chlorine and hydrogen. But I, I, I was quite surprised when, when we started to look at this and also the changes as we go forward. Um, and I'm sorry about the notes at the bottom. They're generally, you know, when I'm presenting to colleagues, we're, we're trying to demystify that, you know, transmission looks like a motorway and, um, you know, 275 tr transmission looks a bit like the A roads, that the, the dual carriageways we see, um, because I think for non for non engineers, this this starts to become quite confusing quite quickly. I think simplifying it, and again, this is something that we're doing within the city region to try and uh, bring our colleagues uh, into uh, what the challenges are of the energy. Um, you know, we've just simplified the the, the circuits here uh, and also looked at what we can do um, with SPEN, uh, you know, so Scottish Power Energy Networks, the Old Man Web area. And, and, you know, they've got they've got a massive sort of network system and, and we work very closely with them as Liverpool City region. And of course, it would be great if we could just connect to the to the DNO, you know, if we could bring it into Birkenhead and, and, and into Liverpool. Uh, but obviously, as uh, you know, we're definitely above 100 megawatts and um, yeah, so we, we have to go to a transmission connection at the moment. And, and again, you know, we, we, we've got a challenge whether that's the best thing for us. You know, it could cost us a couple of hundred million to, to run cables because uh, it's likely to be cables in an underground route down to, to Capenhurst. You know, it, it's very unlikely we're going to be able to run uh, an overhead line um, connection in that area. But, you know, there would be alternates of, of, of connecting and, and dispatching our power in blocks uh, and connecting it elsewhere. So, yeah, one of the challenges that we're starting to think about um, and, and we'll be commissioning studies on quite soon. Um, I, won't, I won't dwell on this, but I think, you know, in terms of a demand side uh, challenge, you, you know, th this is supposed to be a spend represent representation of the capacity that's available. Uh, you know, as you start to, to get down into substations. And, and, you know, what it really says is the city area and the wider Liverpool city region north of the Mersey is very, very congested and, and started to see constraints. Uh, Birkenhead Town Centre is very uh, constrained and the development going on there is going to test uh, the network. Uh, and some of that is a 6.6 .6 kV sort of local system. And as you come into the Wirral, you start to see more capacity. And around the Halton area and Runcorn, there's a little bit more capacity as industry uh, releases some of its uh, connections. But um, yeah, you know, you know, the tidal project is being led by the city region. And it's part of trying to look at, at both the supply side uh, and the demand side. And uh, yeah, I just want to touch on that for a moment um, because, you know, this is quite interesting when we start to look at um, where we fit the project. So we're obviously fitting it as a supply side um, contribution to, to electricity. So currently at the moment, you know, the mix of uh, energy that comes into the city region is around about 20% electricity, which is slightly higher than the sort of national energy uh, electricity usage. We've got a, a big element of natural gas and a big element of petroleum and, and oil products. Um, they go into the transmission system, however we want to call that. Uh, and, and we tend to talk about this middle area as being demand. And what we're focusing more and more on the right hand side uh, within the city region with our local authority partners is around um, what we're calling consumption. Yeah, so really we mean the um, what the consumers are using because um, quite often consumption and demand are taken as being the same thing. Um, and, and we leave lots of our, um, our, our consumers, our, our, our communities behind. Um, quite often when we're talking about demand, we are looking at aggregation and we're looking at ways we can switch demand. And so, you know, really talking about consumption is something that helps um, helps our communities understand a bit more. And I, I suppose the point of this, and, you know, it, it looks quite a rough slide, but we're, we're trying to demystify what the energy system and the electricity contribution is. And when you look at the next slide, you start to uh, be able to explain that, 
you know, traditionally on the left-hand side, we, we've we've got this big mass production of energy. You know, it, it would be the input to a ranking diagram that has got emissions in its production. You know, we're challenging the amount of emissions in electricity and natural gas and in petroleum production. You know, so these are the emissions that you'd have from refineries or from LNG facilities or from power stations. But we're also challenging this bit on on the right hand side in consumption about how much uh, energy is wasted there is, is paid for and that's why we're trying to use this consumption term because this is the energy that we pay for that we then waste and it can be waste because our homes aren't good enough in terms of uh you know energy performance it can be the fact we leave the windows open with the heating on uh, so we're paying for energy here that we're not using Commercial and industry does the same. You know, we we get heat rejection uh, that we we don't use, and you know, transport is a fantastic waste. You know, the internal combustion engine produces a lot of heat. That heat, we you know, we have a cooling system to try and get rid of it. And I think you know, when you change and start to look at electric vehicles, you you probably see, you know, a, um, a, a saving of about two thirds in terms of the energy usage. So. Within the city region, we're also looking at what this looks like in 2030 and 2040. And obviously you start to see petroleum uh, be eroded, natural gas to start uh, reducing and being displaced by some hydrogen and the electricity starting to grow. But all the time we're trying to, to match um, consumption. So we want to people to, to have more efficiency. We want them to reduce their demand um and and at the same time then we can start to balance across the system in terms of having uh more smart controls uh, and being able to to introduce more embedded generation and storage that allows us um not just to match supply and demand but to inform behaviors around consumption so i mean just again just finishing off on the city region you know what where we see our implication you know our intervention sorry is that we want more renewables in the area so roughly you know we want four to five times more um capacity by 2050 because of having gas generation in the area we see the benefit of some carbon capture uh, and obviously we've got carbon sinks off the coast in the Lennox and Hamilton fields that you know potentially are going through licensing now and that fits well really with the decarbonization um, of places like Stanlow, uh, our fertilizer factories, our cement factories, so all our heavy industry that we need to help decarbonize sort of makes carbon capture a regional play that that has got an advantage if we didn't have the industry you know we probably wouldn't want to do carbon capture and build a new abated gas plant but putting carbon capture on our gas generation and using that carbon capture facility to help decarbonize our big industrial emissions and, and keep employment and jobs available I, I think is significant at a high level a regional level, you know, one of the things that's important to us on the Tidal project is that we start to consume less, both in terms of improving the housing stock uh, and the way that, you know, we, we we sort of manage our energy and heat and also by reducing demand. Because actually, you know, green electricity does come with a slight premium. And so the last thing we want to do is have lots of wastage on the consumption side. Uh, at a time when we're adding, you know, a premium sort of product going forward. And then obviously, you know, more solar, more onshore wind. We need to utilize heat pumps both at a, a property level, but also uh, at a community level. And, you know, we're looking at schemes in the Wirral that could have 10, 15 megawatt type centralized heat pumps. And then you get into the interesting area of electric vehicle connections, you know, and, and this idea of vehicle to grid exchanges um at a local level uh, and then more sort of uh larger battery storage and th this is all really acting you know at distribution level uh about bringing that demand and consumption down and one of our challenges is being really um focused on what we where we can get to by 2030 where we can get to by 2040 and where we can get to by 2050 and this isn't just a city region ambition that you know this is the private industry ambition this is uh, the uk law uh, and now it's enforced you know with the committee on climate change forecasts 
So, I mean, just coming back to the project and, you know, so we, we, we see a great heritage in our industry in the region. And, and what we want to do is try and find a way of uh, using our local supply chains. So th this is the sort of scale of a turbine. So this is one of the turbines that went into one of the Korean schemes a few years ago. Uh, so around about 25 megawatts. Um, you know, you can see the, the size of um, two or three guys down at the bottom. So these are about eight meter diameters. You know, they'd be totally submerged. So low tide level would be just above uh, the, the top of the aperture. Um, the, these are going to turn about 50 reps per minute rather than, you know, at 50 reps per second or 50 hertz. So they are relatively slow speed in, in terms of rotating equipment. Um, but, you know, they're, they're using, they've got quite a high sort of uh, water velocity across there. Um, we see them as a modular build. You know, you, you can um, put them into uh, their casing and float them out in the first place. And, and you can get various components out uh, by using, you know, a stop log system or a, a blocker system. But because they're, they're relatively mature technology in terms of uh, hydro type systems, you know, we see these as having uh, quite a high availability. So again, it, it's, we just believe this is relatively low risk, you know, uh, compared to some of the developments we're already seeing in wind turbines. And certainly, you know, it's not the complexity of an aero engine that, that's keeping people up in the, in the sky. And I think, you know, when we think about why we can um, look to develop local supply chains, you know, we've we've got our nuclear supply chain, you know, coming down from Cumbria into Warrington and into uh, Cheshire. Uh, we've got our maritime sort of knowledge. And then we've got, you know, a tremendous, you know, oil, gas, chemical, automotive and, and aerospace. Um, knowledge and, and some of the digital engineering sort of technologies that are being, being built through uh, using University of Liverpool and the engineering centers at Darsbury. Um, we we want to see how far we can go to standing up, um, you know, some manufacturing uh, to support uh, this technology, not not just for our project, but, you know, for, for the wider UK uh, sort of industry. And then, you know, potentially export, but I don't want to oversell the export because that's probably a false promise at the moment. You know, it takes a long time to get these uh, projects going. Uh, but certainly we see the UK having, you know, the potential for, you know, three to three to eight projects over 20 years uh, as, as part of bringing, you know, some diversity into the energy mix. So, you know, we're, we're very interested in supporting our industrial strategy, you know, and future, um, you know, future employment potential. And, yeah, we, on, on the barrage, we might need about 40 of those turbines. So again, you know, it's not um, we're not we're not thinking of building one or two. We, it, it's there's a learning curve effect. There's a little bit more commodity. Uh, and if we had, like I say, four projects around uh, the West Coast that wanted 40 of the machines, you know, that that's a decent size. I mean, current estimate on those machines are probably about you know 10 to 12 million each. So again, relatively high value. Uh, but with additive manufacturing and, and some of the existing maritime skills we've got, uh, and certainly the automotive aerospace skills, th th there's actually a chance for innovation in this. Um, and yeah, we some of the manufacturers are interested in partnering uh, to license. Some of the manufacturers, you know, think they've got their supply chain developed, but no one's really building these machines at volume at this scale at the moment. So, you know, again, um, if they were being built in, in Europe uh, already, we probably wouldn't be trying to, to attract this manufacturer, but we, you know, we, they're not being built in any volume in any single factory anywhere. So I, I suppose in terms of looking forward, we're talking about, you know, a, a decade of effort in terms of development, consenting and engineering, uh, and then construction. And then, you know, someone was quite impressed when we showed this slide the other day. It's the first time they'd seen 2130 on, on, on the Gantt chart. Um, yeah, but it's 100 years plus of generation. This is, um, yeah, this probably is a program that needs a lot of work. It's a multi-phase consenting program, which then needs determination as a DCO. Um, 
a lot of uh, procurement activity, you know, to, to really develop um, the surety around the pricing and, and the methodology. And then a multi-year, multi-season construction phase, obviously marine uh, construction, you know, we, we've got to look at the tides, but also, you know, the seasons. Um, and, and quite an extensive commissioning phase, you know, if, if we've got around 40 machines. So, I mean, just touching back on environmental issues, I mean, th this is, you know, a very sensitive area. The Mersey's seen a tremendous sort of cleanup over the last 30 years from um, it, its sort of legacy around the chemical industry and, and you know, as water quality has improved. So, you know, we're in a position at the moment that we've been uh, talking to various um, stakeholder groups, some of them um, local interest groups, some of them uh, who will be our statutory consultees, but generally um, listening, asking what data and evidence they've got uh, and, and, and trying to to identify what we need to gather for the future. Um, yeah, I made reference earlier to uh, the bridge at Runcorn being built and I think they've got a 20-year monitoring program as part of the Mersey Gateway Environmental Trust. So you know there's, there's data out there, we're seeing um, changes in the river uh, in terms of where the sediment is, you know where the sandbanks form um, and, and that's quite interesting you know we're also the operator of uh, the Mersey ferries and on some low tide days you know we've got sandbanks at the pier head that means we can't get the ferry in. You know, and those sandbanks weren't there five, eight years ago. So, you know, there is movement within the river. You know, we've changed the port structure. We've changed some of the uh, dredging uh, approaches um, and, you know, the sediment has moved. So this is things that we've got to do a lot of modeling and a lot of consideration on. Um, you know, the, the, there's lots of areas that um, uh, I've got wildlife and ecology that we need to both baseline and then think about how we how we deal with that. But at the moment, we're very much in this listening phase uh, and starting uh, to agree the way that we take this forward. Um, I think, you know, people say it's difficult to consent. Um, you know, the, the, the project down in South Wales achieved a consent, you know, um, so there is precedent for, for getting this through. Uh, the investment um, sort of context is changing slowly. You know, we want more and more green electricity. Uh, as we build more and more wind out, then uh, the space for tidal will arrive. And, we, we, yeah, we, we, we think our timescales are realistic. Um, it, it feels a long time, but it's also, you know, we, we've got to build a bit more wind out before um, before we need tidal. So I think in terms of next steps, um, we want to see explicit support uh, from government on tidal range as part of the strategy for 2025 onwards. And yeah, we think uh, this week's change in emission targets uh, is the first step to recognizing that yeah, the potential of tidal range now has to become a probable um, for, for the energy system in the UK. As I've just touched on, we've got a lot of work to do to set out a consenting strategy that's based on, you know, uh, good principles, good objectives with, with you know, um, modern data and evidence plans. But we've also got to think about the trends that are going to happen in the Mersey. So it's no good just saying we need to pass this criteria by consenting. We need to pass this criteria, but also allow for some flexibility. You know, traditionally, you would go out and count uh, a certain species in a certain season, you know, it's quite possible that we'll say, well, actually, you should have counted it a month earlier because, you know, temperatures have been a lot different this this year or next year. So we're going to have to think about, you know, the static and the dynamic modeling and surveying that we do to set out, um, a, you know, a, a strong justification for, for introducing this infrastructure into the marine environment. I think gradually our energy modeling and detailed understanding uh, of the processes is, is advancing well. Um, obviously, we've not designed the machines that we absolutely need at the moment. And, and therefore, we're modeling, we're looking at tide range, we're looking at effectiveness. You know, we, we think turbines will generally be the same, but we, we might go for a mix of turbines, either from different manufacturers or slightly different sizes. Uh, obviously, we want to get the fleet benefit of the maximum number of uh, machines that are similar for spares and for maintenance. 
but because the tide changes over you know a fortnightly cycle we also want to get uh, the best performance out of the machines that are operational and then yeah the complexity of this is then bringing it through into you know building up a capital cost um you know it, it's going to be um a a bit more money for the development activity which is always the at-risk money and and then that will build in confidence uh through quotation and working with the supply chain to look at the overall capital costs and then hopefully being able to arrive on a funding structure that that might be more right like a regulated asset base than a, a cfd contract for difference model you know we're a long-term asset with a high capital cost in the first place but with very low electricity generation cost over over life and again we're offering 100 120 years of generation off this project um, it's very difficult to assess that back 50 years in terms of value once you um, you know look at depreciating uh, you know your cash flows etc and i think that was probably it just to sum up again that liverpool city region uh, represents the six local authorities that you know are supportive of the scheme and again that 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 support is important uh liverpool city region is also you know the the, the brand that um is now mercy travels so we operate the ferries uh, and the tunnels um and so quite often i get asked if it was a barrage would you put a road across it well you know we've actually got two tunnels that are already roads um so we're looking in the first place as an energy project you know there could be some amenity you know uh benefits but you know it may not be a barrage it may, it may be a lagoon uh, and generally you know we're supported by the local sort of growth partnerships both in uh in terms of uh, the local enterprise partnership and the growth hubs um and i probably need to breathe for a moment Martin. To kind of give you a rest, Martin. I think that was absolutely phenomenal. I mean, the, 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 we actually have got um, 65 questions in the chat, in the Q&A boxes. And it's interesting how it's gone along. The questions have arisen and a lot of the questions have been answered. So the issues of the environment, location, there's a question on, will it create a road bridge, which is one of the last thing you commented on, will it be a road route? So, how would you like to play it? We've got, oh, 68, no, 68 questions. Do you want to look down and pick a couple of representative ones because... Yeah, let, let, let me have a look at them, Robert. I mean, unfortunately, I couldn't see the questions because I, I got the slides in front of me. So apologies. Um, it would have been nice that I could have answered some as I went through. But if I have answered that, that that would be good. Let me just click on them and... You've answered a lot of the questions as you've been along. For example, this is of, of, of the environmental impact of the project is, it, is in a number of the questions. Uh, if you have a quick look, you'll see that. Yeah. So, so have, let, let, have a look. Yeah, let, let me sort of start. And I'll, I'll, I'll probably, well, I'll, I'll work from one end to the other. So I'm going to go in reverse order um, on the basis that if I've answered some, I'll, I'll find that out as I, I get to the earlier questions. So I think in terms of other schemes around the UK and their progress, um, that the, there's under the British Hydro Association, uh, there's something called the Tidal Range Alliance, which is like a subset uh, of the, the industry group under British Hydro. Uh, I guess there's probably 10 to 12 schemes that are um, sort of named in there with various levels of development. Obviously, uh, the Swansea project, Tidal Lagoon project, uh, it is in front of us. It consented. Um, you know wh whether it started its development or not. I think it's a matter for them. Um, you know, it's uh, it's potentially protected its consent by doing a little bit of work. Uh, so that's more advanced. Uh, is it going to go into investment soon? I don't know. Um, so there's other projects, you know, there's a project across on the north bank of the Dee at the port of Moston. There's ideas around Colwyn Bay and up at uh, Morecambe. So I think we're, we're all after the same thing. I see it as complementary that there's a number of projects rather than competitive. Obviously, on the project, we all want to be first, but actually, I'm unlikely to be the first. And so for me, 
I want to learn off the other projects and, and bring that learning into making our project more secure. I think the only way we will get the real level of government support is if we are as an industry that, that's got some repeatability and brings some stability uh, to the generation mix. So I think a one-off project is not the answer for us together. Um, so, so I think that was that one. Tide changes over an 18-year cycle. 2019 was a peak. Okay. Um, I think just just in terms of uh, where we see peaks in the future, uh, generally our structures will cope with overtopping. So if we had a, a, a high tide and the storm surge that could be a couple of meters, um, our infrastructure will be robust to take that, the same as a wharf is. Um, you know, that means that some of our electrical equipment has to be, you know, in weatherproof and watertight rooms. Uh, it means that if we've got people out there, we have to give them safe refuge. Uh, but generally, the you know the difference in uh, high tide at spring and high tide on the neap, I, I can't remember. Yeah, you know, one and a half, two meters. So we're, we're generally dealing with a high tide that's going to get higher, uh, and, and you know we need to be have equipment that's protected in the right way and, and space for people to be protected. Um, in terms of a, a process diagram, I mean, we, we've certainly got a little animation that I don't risk show you that shows, you know, the tide coming in, uh, being held one side of the containment wall uh, until it's built to, you know, nearly its maximum. And then we open uh, the turbines up and let that uh, level, you know, go into, into the basin. And then as the tide starts to come out, um, yeah, the tide would disappear from one side of the containment like you would see at any seawall and we'd be still holding the water back and then we'd let that that head go, you know, that would that height go through the turbine. And so you just repeat that four times a day. Uh, but we have got um, we, we have got. Um, you know, some some animation on that that I, I think we will probably put on on the website. Um, I think in terms of generators lifetime 20 to 40 years, I, I'm not saying that we won't replace. What I'm generally saying is, you know, we're now seeing um, winter, wind farms uh, starting, you know, that have got the one and a half to two and a half megawatt turbines thinking about what they do. Um, they can replace them like for like, uh, which is fine, but also, the, you know, wind farms have moved on significantly and they're thinking about whether they want to put uh, two and a half megawatt machines back on the old uh, stems or whether they want to get rid of some of them and put some new, you know, uh, 12 megawatt machines in. So, you know, take five out and put one in, you know, so that would be a new project to us, uh, you know, rather than a retrofit. Certainly on nuclear, you know, we, we talk about an age of nuclear for, for about 60 years. We talk about, you know, gas rotating plant being 40 years. Um, I suppose our coal fleet spoils us a little bit. Most of that ran for 40, 50, 60 years. Uh, but generally, we, our, our asset would be there for 120 years, even if we're doing maintenance, um, you know, and replacement on the machines. So we're more like a hydro project that's built for a century. You know, most power stations come and go in 50 years. Um, in terms of accessing shipping and boats, if we went for a barrage, uh, there's obviously be locks. You know, um, you still have to get to the ship canal and, and the QE2 dock. Uh, if we do a lagoon, then there would be um, the equivalent of locks, but, you know, perhaps they would be more like a gate. Um, you know, if we were built near wind farms, we might need to get jack-up barges through, uh, you know, which are quite shallow. Uh, but um, quite wide in terms of beam. Uh, so we've got to look at that. And we've got a, a marine navigation study that started already. Obviously, with Liverpool being successful in its fleet port bid, you know, we might see a few more ships. So guess what? You know, we, we, we've we got a bigger challenge than we thought in terms of uh, the traffic we might need to, um, we might need to, to be able to accommodate. Um, 
high capital costs. So, I mean, at the moment, you know, you, if you take nuclear and carbon capture, they're, they're both looking for support over and above the, the wholesale price um, of electricity. You know, that's done through generally contract for difference. Um, the contract for difference um, might be a way of looking for us, but, you know, our generation annually is a bit lower than, than uh, nuclear, you know, or quite a lot lower than nuclear. So we're not a base low plant. So we're looking at probably a regulated asset base, which might be the model that, that Sizewell survives uh, under. You know, I think EDF has said they don't particularly want to uh, have balance sheet finance with CFD for Sizewell, and they're trying to have a regulated asset base, which starts to give you income on day one of construction and not day one of operation. Uh, because we're a publicly led project at the moment, and again, you know, that's important. We're gigawatt scale publicly led. We can probably attract borrowing at very, very low interest over, over term. So the regulated asset based support from government uh, with a low lending model could bring our cost of capital right down. Um, we've had some pension fund interest. Um, you yeah, know, it's too early to say whether it's sensible for us to do that. So I think in terms of the 100 year expected life, I mean, it's a really good question because I think it's like a tunnel, you know, you, you design a tunnel for 100 years, you know, so you might replace the ventilation fans, but actually after 100 years, you're probably going to keep going, but we've, we've got to put a number on it. So generally we've put 100, um, we've put 100 year sort of civil life on it. We might need to come back on the containment uh, and deal with erosion. You know, um, you know the state of the concrete. We'll have some armoring systems, uh, rock armor. Yeah, you know, that takes the energy out of the tide and 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 the surge outside the structures. Um, but you know, you really, you know, I, I think it's a combination system. It's a sea defense structure that retains water and the power generation system. The M&E equi equipment is similar to every other piece of M&E equipment. It, it's got maintenance and, and replacement. The structural issue, again, it, it is a challenge over a different lifetime. Um, I think that in, in terms of the barrage, we, if we went for a barrage option, we, we would be building you know, a couple of kilometer uh, barrage across the river and using the, the river banks as containment uh, for the rest of the water. If we build a lagoon, then we've got to offshore create that whole containment area, um, which, which you know, is in tens of kilometers if you, um, if you go for a big scheme. Um, and obviously that attracts a high capital cost. So you can get more power offshore, uh, but you've got a high cost of, of building, um, you know, uh, retention, you know, for about 10 meters deep. Um, how much confidence in modeling techniques for environment effects? Um, I, I think, I, I I think there's a there's a lot of work to be done on what the right baseline for modeling is, you know, in terms of um, all sorts of different things from sediment to water chemistry. Um, you know, the Mersey, we, we think, has a different uh, set of chemistries uh, to, say, the seven and to other areas. Um, and, you know, what we're trying to do in the next six months is talk to some of the subject matter experts and see where the latest is on both what you have to do against regulation, but where the la latest modeling techniques can take you with, with digital methods, because some of these things aren't done as often enough against a, a, a test threshold. Um, you know, um, so I, I think it's one of the most interesting areas that we could actually um, work with a lot of the environment stakeholders to understand a lot more. I mean, the Mersey is, is quite funny. I mean, my, my belief at the moment from what I'm told is as it's got cleaner, we've seen quite a change in the ecology. And, and some of that change is counterintuitive. The, there's less, um, what I'm going to say, waste in the water. And so there's less feedstock in some of the water uh, for certain species. For other species, the water's better and there's more. So the, there's all sorts of, um, there's all sorts of, trends that we've got to look at um, and again sea level rise is, is that bigger trend that we we've got to understand um, i think in terms of thinking about how you do the engineering modeling and how you create big structures and get them 
to sit on the seabed or the riverbed and, and to assess the settlement and to assess the long-term settlement uh, is going to be really interesting. You know, there's probably levels of ground improvement that we need to do, um, you know, and dredging. Um, I think, you know, moving on to the idea of sort of tidal range as a, a national strategy, I think it's been there in 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 the background for, for 10, 15 years. I think this recent push this week on the 2038 targets is going to say we need everything we can get. I think the downside is just if all of the countries in the world don't move at the same pace, then there'll have to be a view at how far we go towards net zero, you know, because we, we don't want to spend more and more money on our energy systems and, and our energy if other countries aren't doing the same. So we, we, we can have the ambition to get there, but we have to keep competitive uh, internationally. And we, we, we don't want to burden our industry with higher energy prices that makes them move elsewhere because that would be wrong. But I think the one great thing is we've got government policy lined up behind energy and we've had cross party support for you know probably 10, 20 years, uh, which, which means it's really, um, you know, one of the few areas that everyone is aligned on and we're seeing transition and we're seeing the evidence uh, of both, you know, wind helping decarbonisation, but also, you know, unfor unfortunately, in terms of engineering, we've seen our coal stations close in terms of climate. You know, that that's a really hard decision, isn't it? Shutting down assets that could have run for longer, but environmentally it was the right decision and, and and companies have gone with it you know most coal stations have shut early you know um because you know they weren't seeing the load that that justified them staying open uh in terms of sedimentation and dredging i think yeah the, there will be a capital dredging program to to prepare the area and then there will be levels of operational or maintenance dredging um, to keep uh, both uh, navigation channels and uh, some of the uh, generation channel um, in to the dimensions to the parameters we want. I think some of the velocity flows will help with that. You know, some of the the way the water moves will help with it, but under different conditions, we'll get different modelling. And I think I think. Yeah, that's something we're really interested in, and we're working with the sort of National Oceanographic Centre in Liverpool and the universities to try and understand that modelling. We've got some other consultancies helping us with that. Um, I think in terms of overcome environment legal challenges, um, I think at the moment, you know, we, we're talking to the stakeholders. We've seen. Um, you know, a project in South Wales uh, achieve consent. So we're not we're not the first people to want to do this, and we're unlikely to be the second project to do this. So um, it's a balance of, of how I think together we judge is this the right thing to do. So if if we've got sea level rise, we've got changes in our uh, marine environment, which is sensitive already. Could this be a benefit to that, or or is it is it still you know a negative impact? And yeah, I think the next six months we'll we'll discuss that that further. And um, I I think the projects should be consentable, but we also need to deal not just with current regulation, but what's going to happen anyway. What would be really naive is for us to do lots of surveys, lots of modeling, lots of justification and say, OK, we've passed the criteria against what um, the requirements are, because I think we're seeing more and more in the development consent orders that there's concerns that then emerge, there's trends, uh, there's issues around climate change that haven't been concerned. So I don't think the regulation in itself is the challenge. I think it's our view of how uh, trends in, in climate change are affecting our natural environment and, and whether we can agree that uh, projects that have impact um, are dealing with them. Um, you know, and I think there's a couple of decisions around DCOs recently that have been both challenged and overturned and, you know, re-challenged. Um, so, um, yeah. 
Oh, let me just, what depth are the turbines installed? So, I mean, we're looking at founding levels of some of our structures around minus 20. Uh, and I, I can't actually remember if that's minus 20 ordnance data or chart data. Uh, and I know there's a five meter sort of difference in those two. But generally, the, the turbines we're looking at around about seven to eight meters diameter. And the top of that inlet would always be underwater. So at low tide, you still wouldn't see them um, because obviously, you know, we're, we're trying to avoid any sort of cavitation. So these are going relatively deep. Uh, for those that, you know, have been on the river and seen, you know, the QE2, the Queen Mary and all these ships come up the river in, in places, the river is quite deep in other places we'll have to have to dredge it in terms of locks for ship access we're doing a marine navigation study um you know that's going to do the equivalent of, of looking at traffic patterns there's something amazing like i don't know thirty-five thousand vessel movements on on the mersey a year uh you know both in terms of the ferries and you know the ferries to ireland container ships liverpool's benefited benefited from brexit we've got a free port yeah so we, we we're very um very aware that we need um to accommodate that and, and naturally they the mersey docks and harbour which is part of peel uh and manchester ship canal which is also peel um you know will be a statutory consultee um, you know, we've got a good relationship with them, but, you know, they're not going to let us affect their commercial uh, operations. And similarly, ABP down at Garston and, and some other operators, you know, they're going to want assurances that we we keep navigation open. And, you know, that, that's part of the, the economy for the region as well. Um, artists' impressions, um, I think we're, we're very early in terms of that. We've got some functional um ideas uh, of what the scheme would look like uh in terms of what containment um looks like um what we have to do is is be relatively careful that you know you can imagine that a containment wall looks like the seafront at wallacy um you know and what we have to do is now design something that's appropriate we we haven't made a scheme selection so uh, we we may have some early impressions, but we've also got to be careful that we don't give the wrong uh, impression about where we are in the process, because that would make it look like we were starting to get into scheme design uh, and consenting, and, and we've not formally launched that. So we're still in this feasibility. So I think there are some images. Uh, I'll check you know, whether the, we can get those on our website. Um, but like I say, it, it it can be quite dangerous. There was lots of work. You know, someone did a nice competition for one of the universities and they came up with some great schemes. And now people keep telling me they know what my scheme looks like. And I'm going, well, uh, that's good because I don't. Uh, but there was the idea of the S-curve across the Mersey with big towers and uh, greenery. And, you know, it, it looked fantastic, but it, it, it wasn't what we were doing. It, it was, you know, an idea from from a student. Fantastic idea, but it wasn't what we were doing. Uh, so, in 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 terms of the idea of the tide cycle and the flow rates, um, you know, we, we've got the option on how many turbines we use as as the tide changes. So, if, if we had say forty turbines. You know, would we use 30 at a high load factor or, you know, would we use uh, 40 at slightly lower load factor? So, you know, that's part of the machine optimization and the control system. Uh, at times we want a bigger aperture. We want the, the space for more water to come through uh, because that reduces the sort of ripple effect or the surge that you'll get on the downstream side. Uh, but that's all part of the, the, the modeling and, it, you know, it's quite a sensitive balance. Uh, between energy extraction and maintaining the sort of tidal impact. Roughly turbine maintenance costs. Ooh, I, I don't know how I'd quote that, but you know, we, we're, we're thinking about O and M costs. You know, in the in the twenty to thirty million a year. Um, you know, for a hundred years, and you know, don't quote me on what inflation that is. And but you know, around about that. So the equivalent of you know replacing two machines a year 
we're trying to keep 40 machines live. So I'm not suggesting we replace them every year. I'm, I'm suggesting it's about the same magnitude, uh, you know, in terms of preventative maintenance. Um, one, one of the challenges is how much scaling we get. Uh, the, the project in South Korea had a real problem that it flooded its uh, draft tubes to the area where the blades set early. Uh, but wasn't using them on, on generation because the rest of the project wasn't finished. Uh, and it probably spent a lot of money trying to get them back to uh, initial condition, uh, you know, with divers and, and, you know, arrangements to try and get some of that scaling off uh, the equipment uh, before it even started. Um, floating tidal, uh, probably not anywhere near the scale of sort of generation that we're looking at. We think there's lots of opportunities for added technology, uh, but it doesn't particularly make us more economic. So for instance, if we had a, a, a coastal lagoon, you could put floating solar in the middle, but floating solar could go in the middle, could go there anyway. The only thing we do really is give it uh, that wind protection that, that, that makes it uh, more secure. Um, the viability of a floating solar project, for instance, you know, would, would stand alone uh, for this. You know, it, it's not going to make us better. We've looked at different devices that you can mount on the wall that would give you supplementary generation. And again, you know, they can all work, uh, but they could work at the moment on, on some of the key wall or the, the sea wall, you know, around the Mersey. Um, so we do think there's other things that, that can play in technology, but it, it's not really in the core brief. Would we get a river crossing out of it? Not at the moment. You know, that's not in the remit. And again, it, it's important that what we don't do is add extra functionality and scope um, that we then take off the project because then it looks like we've, you know, given a false promise. So if I said you, you could have a cycleway and a monorail and then I don't do it, everyone gets upset. So at the moment, we're doing the core energy project. Um, obviously, there's potential to, to add things on, but they're not for my budget you know that they're, they're for a more strategic budget um efficiency of the lagoon against the estuary it's really interesting we can probably do more with the lagoon but it costs us more so for instance if we were letting the tide come into the center of a lagoon so you know a, a, a ring just off the coast um the tide gets to its its normal maximum height by flowing through the machines. It might be sitting, say, at 10 meters inside. We could turn our generators into pumps and move it up to 12 meters. And then when the tide goes out, we could let it go. So we could probably, at peak price, get more out of a lagoon, but it's going to cost us more to build. If we were doing it on the river and it's a barrage, we probably wouldn't want to over pump into the Mersey Basin and, and and flood more of the sort of salt marsh, you know, that would probably be a restriction that, that you know, wouldn't be acceptable. So offshore does give you more flexibility. You you could, in effect, hold uh, the water in a, in a lagoon longer. You could, you know, you, you, you could hold it back a couple of hours. Again, you probably wouldn't want to do that on the river because you'd affect uh, the intertidal area and the zones. You know, we, we might affect the river area by half an hour, 40 minutes in terms of changing the pattern, but we wouldn't want to, you know, take it, you know, hold water back for full cycles all the way up to Warrington. You know, that just seems unacceptable in, in sort of the current quit. Uh, um, just in terms of the cost elements of turbines, yeah, th there's a huge challenge that there is a limited market, and that's why we're thinking about can we stand up manufacture. So we've potentially got six manufacturers interested, three that are, are more well established. Um, part of the challenge is in the control system rather than in the turbine itself you know so yes it's it's a marine sort of piece of rotating plant uh, we need to take the benefit of uh, manufacturers experience but we also think there's a lower risk if we were to, to look to do that in partnership and license um then then you know it's not an aero engine it yes it's a complex piece of equipment but again it's not an aero engine so we we think we'd have the skills in region to try and do this um 
So we do think we could get the price down. We do think there are prices, you know, that are available, at, you know, outside of the UK that are attractive. But again, we don't think that's an acceptable solution at the moment. But, you know, that would be, you know, our, our need to bring competition into the supply chain. Um, I think just in terms of the ship canal and, and Garston docks, you know, they're part of critical local infrastructure, you know, that they, they support industry and, and all sorts of other things. We, we, we will generally be close to them, but we need to provide transit. So they maintain, you know, their current level of operation. Um, I think there's a question then around uh, ITM power and green hydrogen. Yeah, it'd be really interested in <clears throat> some of the excess electricity could go into electrolyzers. Those electrolyzers could be on the structure of the um, of the the project. Um, it'd be really interesting uh, to look at that. I think the the issue at the moment is electrolyzers are very expensive. They will come down in cost as they come down in cost. You know, tidal energy or wind energy can be used to to help uh, produce hydrogen. I think. You know, Net Zero Northwest uh, and Northwest Hydrogen Alliance and High Net are, are looking at how we fuel switch within the Northwest, uh, get rid of a lot of our natural gas and bring in hydrogen. We're talking to everyone about that, but the, it's not easy to get the viability there at the moment till you know the cost of fuel cells come down. I mean, just by the by, you know, uh, within Mersey area, we we're placing our order for the first. Uh, 20 hydrogen buses so we've got an absolute um you know ambition to have green hydrogen coming into our system as part of our transport system yeah we've got 20 buses on order we've got a thousand buses running in region so that's the sort of potential we've got for for hydrogen into heavy transport um whether tidal or wind produces that uh electricity um you know we'll, we'll have to see uh, Laurence does some pumping. Yeah, we're thinking of doing some pumping. Obviously, turning a, a one gigawatt generator into a you know 200 or 300 megawatt pump in system is a little bit of a challenge. But you know, we're, again, we're engineers. We like challenge. Um, we've got a you know you've got to look at the price difference. So if <coughs> if high tide is at peak period, you're not particularly going to want to buy. Uh, peak electricity uh, to do that pumping. So it will generally be, you know, it will be part of a plan sort of trading optimization on when we pump. Um, you know, it will have to be just in front of a peak where we can get some premium on, on that generation. Otherwise, you know, um, we, we probably wouldn't make money out of it. Um, next question was really on nuclear energy. Um, yeah, I mean, UK's got a, a, a tremendous nuclear ambition in terms of building some more large nuclear and then building a fleet of SMRs, um, you know, at 300, 400 megawatt scale. Um, you know, we we see that as something that's good for the, the Northwest in terms of employment. Um, we see that as uh, something that is likely to happen. You know, it's part of policy. Um, you know, there's the idea of 20 gigawatts of new nuclear being built. Um, and obviously, you, you know, Hinkley Point, Sizewell, and, and another big station like that, we, we could give you 10 gigawatts, so that would still leave another 10 gigawatts of, of sort of small modular, sorry, yeah, the, the SMR program. Um, but, you know, on occasion, something happens or the technology doesn't work. Work and you know there may be a, a different technology choice. I mean, after Fukushima, you know some some global countries changed their mind on nuclear. Uh, we do we we use that sort of motivation to to try and get our safety criteria even better. And I think the ONR have done a great job on that. But I think you know we have to be complementary. Nuclear could be good. Carbon capture could be good. Uh, but equally, tidal could be good. You know, wind and solar, you know, can't give us everything. Um, there's a whole question there around sort of dredging um, and cost of en energy. I think, you know, these are all things we're working through as part of the feasibility now. Um, 
you know the channels for for shipping at the moment are as you go down to Garston and as you go down to the ship canal are quite close to the bank you know so the middle area you know does get uh, quite a lot of sediment um we're, we're choosing part of the deeper part of the river and then offshore part of the deeper part of um you know the gradients of of, of the seabed they're the areas that we're focusing on and obviously um we, we're trying to assess the the type of dredging that that we might have to do o over time um and you know there's not an easy answer to that over the next year or so and i think in terms of cost of electricity it's just a little bit too early you know we know what our sort of target price is uh, to be competitive to get an investment case um and you know it, it it's based on getting this whole supply chain and capital cost um you know under control you know and and big capital projects have big numbers and, and what we've got to do is get a firm view of um, our costs and then a firm view of what we think power price will do in the future and you know it's that combination that will make the project viable or not viable um there's a question an interesting question around local demand and, and national demand I, I i think one one thing we do, we just believe in is that regional demand is, is generally best supported by some form of regional generation otherwise you're building long distance assets the the, the efficiency or the losses might might be low but you're still having to pay for those assets so we've got assets transmission assets in region um that are now being underutilized because we've closed out generation so you know we've had two gigawatts go from fiddlers but the network's still there that can accept two gigawatts and, and therefore if, if you let renewables be built elsewhere then that means new transmission needs to be built and, and that goes on your bill so you know it's up to us to actually step up the amount of generation in the area I, i'm probably robert i've probably run out of questions to answer in the time um, but yeah, I will go through the others. Martin, I, I think you've done absolutely brilliantly. Um, I think uh, out of sheer exhaustion, we've been talking now for close on one hour 40. So I, I think uh, a lot of questions have been covered and a lot of interest. It's been a remarkable webinar. Um, and still out there, there are still 221 people out of the 420 at the start. So I think that's remarkable. So. I think if you don't mind, I think it, it, it's a good time to stop and um, we can look at the questions if you like and maybe I think this almost comes across to me as a, a project to be revisited sometime in the future. Uh, it, it's, it's a very interesting story and we're, we're only part way through the journey of understanding what can be done. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah, I'd welcome the chance to come back and tell you where we are. Um, I, yeah. I think some of the questions are, are good. Yeah, uh, sorry, all the questions are good, but some of them are challenging that we, we can't give the absolute answer at the moment, but it, it's it's part of, you know, sharing this. Um, I think the other point is we don't know everything yet. You know, that's why we're, we're still in feasibility stage. You know, this isn't a commodity we can just go out and build tomorrow. Um, it, it's something we've got to work hard at, but I think, you know, for me, it was why I took the job to do something that I thought was um, challenging in region. I grew up around here and, and you know, we, we want to give it our best shot. We've, we've had one interesting comment on the close of so leaving. You suggest we should rerun the webinar in 20, 2130 and see how we get on. Well, I, I think that's fine. Yeah, I'm not yeah. sure I'll be here. <laughs> exactly. Well, I think that I think we should close on that. I, I don't want to do it and for Carl. I've set up a little Teams meeting. You want to have a little close out, just chat, just privately. And I think of that, I think we should close. And I thank you very much. I mean, it's as